Welcome, everyone. It is time to look at some galaxies tonight. I'm Brian Autumn, and we're going to see some galaxies. And uh, it, unlike when we were on last time, we were looking at the uh, Christmas star, the conjunction that uh, was bright in the west. That was fun. But uh, tonight we'll be looking at some galaxies. And uh, the good news is that um, the weather is looking fantastic out in the desert. And so, and the equipment is operating, so that's all good. And uh, just to let you know, um, this will be uh, recorded and put up on my YouTube channel, just like uh, the other ones that you could have seen if you want to go back and see the Christmas star one. That's there on the on the recording. So I've prepared prepared a little uh, video that kind of explains you know, me and the, and the, and how uh, I got here and all of that. And so I'm going to. Uh, narrate that for you. Um, we're, it, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to be able to have technology nowadays to be able to uh, look at uh, through a telescope that is 2,000 miles away from where you are located. And so that's the, the amazing thing we'll be doing tonight. And it's something that, that the technology allows us to do. Now myself, I started this whole journey when I was 12. I saw a uh, blood red lunar eclipse. I started to get a little telescope, a medium telescope, a bigger telescope, and all the way up to a telescope that requires a ladder. I even got a dome and uh, had a blast looking at things and sharing the sky with other people. But the light pollution has just got worse and worse and worse, and it's just uh, to the point where uh, it's, it's impossible to see the Milky Way from my backyard, and that makes it hard to see some things. So I travel, I take pictures, and I go to Florida, get the pictures of the meteor showers, and go to Canada and be able to see the, uh, the, the aurora and the northern lights, and that is really fantastic. But I really want to take pictures of deep space. Well, it's tough to do that here in Michigan because look at the light pollution. Holy cow. So if you go down in the desert, look at that down there in the Arizona, New Mexico area. It is dark. There are no cities. And so this light, this picture is kind of beautiful, but it's not beautiful. Uh, this is another uh, fringe benefit to going down to the desert. It's cloudy here a lot in Michigan. It is like almost as cloudy as Seattle here. And down in the desert, it is clear. It is clear 200 days a year, totally clear 200 days a year. So I removed my equipment and put it in the RV and drove it out west from Michigan all the way out to the desert to the bottom of New Mexico. And it's at Dark Sky, New Mexico. It's a telescope ranch. They don't grow cows. They grow telescopes. Here's a drone video. And it shows that uh, these buildings have roll-off roofs, not domes. The roofs uh, slide sideways on wheels, and uh, that's how they open and close, just like your garage door, only 90 degrees from that. And this just shows that each building has, it has a roof that opens. Each building has one, two, three, up to nine telescopes inside. What's interesting here is this telescope at the top that's blue, that with the big red telescope, it was Clyde Tombaugh's personal telescope. Clyde Tombaugh was the guy who discovered Pluto. So that's kind of cool. Now, now earlier tonight, I had to, um, I had to, uh, I had to um, open the roof earlier tonight. So that was hard, um, but it was really not too bad. Um, All right, so there's the the roof is opening up, and uh, this is what the uh, um, are we doing good on the uh, picture? The, the sound is great. Sound is great. All right, I'm going to pause the video here just for a second. My telescope is a very normal telescope. It started its life as a Dobsonian there on the left in Taiwan, and uh, it was specialized for photography. The Canon camera has been modified a little bit, but it's pretty much just what you could buy at the store. What is uh, special about what I've got is this white robotic mount. The computerized mount is amazing. It's made in Michigan by Plane Wave, and it allows me to do the stuff that you're going to see tonight. So that's the, the coolest thing of what I've got is that uh, the, the mount system. So um, we're going to be able to use that here and show you. And the good equipment has allowed me to get better and better pictures over time. I uh, started taking pictures back in 2000 and what was it, 2005, 
And so in the upper left, that's my best Orion from 2005. And then it gets better and better until now. So that gives you an idea of uh, what we can do with the telescope. So we're going to uh, now take a look at what's actually going on. And what we've got here is me in the bottom right, uh, our agenda of things we're going to see tonight. And in the upper right, we have a video, uh, a live shot of what the telescope looks like. And uh, I think what I've got to do here is to turn on the uh, night vision because you're not going to be able to see the telescope unless I turn on the night vision, which is uh, basically infrared. So what it does is it turns on infrared here. There. Now you can see the telescope is pointing straight up. And what we have here is a, this is a map of the sky. Okay? Uh, north is to the top. Um, S, south is at the bottom. And where the telescope was pointing, it's a green dot. So we're pointing straight up. Okay? And uh, where we want to point is going to be green and yellow. You'll see it in a second. So what we want to do tonight to start out with is let's see something close by that might be easier to, for us to see. And so what I'm going to go to is I'm going to push this button, and we're going to go to the Subaru cluster. The Subaru cluster is uh, the Seven Sisters, or it's also called the Pleiades. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer the question as soon as we take a picture. This is a star we took a picture of earlier, just to try to get things focused. Because I take a picture of stars, you know, just to uh, to try to get things nice and focused. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and take a, a an exposure, 25 seconds of the Subaru cluster, and let's look at that question. So what, the sh how, what, what makes galaxies their shape? And then oh, we got a wonderful question about what makes galaxies the different shapes. And I'm going to answer that exact question. Exactly. And so uh, we'll get to that. I promise. So we're going to talk about galaxy shapes. And, uh, but it, basically they, are, they spin. A lot of them have spiral arms, and they spin. And that's why they, the, the, the coolest galaxies, have, at least in my opinion, have that, that spiral structure. So we're going to look at something close by in our galaxy. And I'm going to go full frame on this. This is the Subaru, the, the Seven Sisters. And uh, look at that. It's a beautiful a cluster that you can see with your naked eye. It looks like a mini dipper. And uh, it's just really, really great. It, they're close by. And uh, there's some nebula. Can you see the, the wispy, smoky regions there? And originally, when I, I originally, for, for 30 years, I thought that this, ga this nebula, this gas, this cloudy stuff, was part of the cluster was maybe left over for when they were born or something like that. But someone corrected me about four years ago and said, no, that just happens to be a, a bunch of gas that's in between us and them. And it's just dr drifting by. So I, that, you learn new things every day. So I wanted to show you that. And, and then I can also now uh, take uh, to show you what my picture looks like. If you take a five-minute exposure of this, and keep on going for four hours, this is what you get. So that's a uh, four-hour exposure of the, the Seven Sisters. And I took that uh, a couple years ago. I've had the telescope for seven years. And so um, this gives you an idea of what you can do with a lot, a lot of exposure. Uh, so that's a lot. But hey, um, this is still pretty good for... Um, for just a, a, a short, um, uh, just for a short exposure. All right, we got Bill Gates giving me nasty uh, messages about my windows, but we're just going to uh, ignore Bill for a second there, and we're going to press on because now we have to head off out of our galaxy to another galaxy. So, what's the best galaxy? Well, the best galaxy is Andromeda because it is one of our closest neighbors. It is spectacular. And it is located right here. And uh, this uh, star chart, this is basically a star chart. And, and I also recommend everybody, you can get this on your phone, okay? Uh, you, can, you can download an app on your phone to uh, look at, to have the stars at wherever you live at wherever time you want. And uh, Sky Safari is the best 
in my opinion, for Apple, uh, Apple phones and also uh, Android. So I definitely recommend you get uh, Sky Safari, but we can zoom in here to, to the constellation of Andromeda. And I want to click, I want to be precise about this. I'm going to click directly on the Andromeda Galaxy. I hit Go To, and it, there's a few second delay, but if you watch the, uh, there, you can see that the uh, telescope move. There it goes. And so now the cluster we were just looking at was just, you know, light took only a couple hundred years to get here. Well, this light we're about to get right now, the light took two and a half million years to get here. So two and a half million years ago, the, the first humanoids were on the Earth. So that is the, the amazing thing. So I'm going to take a 45 second picture because we really want to get some really uh, great um, detail on Andromeda. Andromeda is the furthest thing that you can see with your naked eye. So if you can get out away from city lights where it is nice and dark, and you know where to look, and the, you know how you find out where to look? You get one of those programs for your phone, and you turn the brightness down, right, on the phone, or even better, uh, turn it on uh, red mode. They have red mode on your phone. And, uh, and then you can know where to look, and you can see Andromeda with your eye. It looks like a little misty football, little football. And it's very cool. And if you got binoculars, highly recommend it, because Andromeda is spectacular with any binoculars, any even cheap binoculars, it works really well. Even opera glasses would work really well. Okay, so a couple of questions. There's a couple of questions. Um, about black holes, where do they come from? Where well, there are black holes in probably this galaxy we're about to see right now. Black holes come from uh, stars that are dying, that have died. Large stars, huge stars. So what we've got here is we're looking right at the uh, nucleus, the center of uh, Andromeda Galaxy, and there's probably a massive black hole at the center, just like there is a black hole at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And uh, we can see the, the, the stars that are whipping around and getting eaten by that black hole in our Milky Way. But uh, let's go full frame because this one is very impressive. Uh, so, can a star turn into a, a planet? Can a star turn into a planet? No, not really, because planets are small. Uh, stars are big, galaxies are huge, and so uh, planets are usually small, and even if they're uh, rather big, um, they usually are born a star or born a planet, one or the other. You can't have both. What makes them? It's, it's sheer size. The sheer size makes the difference. Uh, planets are small, and burning. stars are big, and stars get are big. They're so big that they uh, start to collapse. And when they collapse, that causes the nuclear fusion, which is the burning, which causes the light. So they have to be massive in order to be a star. And planets are just not quite big enough. Now, it is to said that uh, Jupiter could, was a failed star. If it was just a little bigger, it might have turned into a star. But let's take a look at, at Andromeda Galaxy. This is the best one there is. Um, you've got that bright nucleus with just jam-packed with stars. And you have this spiral structure. And you can see that, that uh, uh, Andromeda is not face-on to us, right? So if, if, if my phone is face-on to the camera here, right? But if I tilt the phone, that's how Andromeda is, right? Andromeda is tilted this way, right? Like a uh, Frisbee, right? And you can see the these... It's, a fl it's pretty much flat. It's like a, a Frisbee or a, a pancake, and that's what our galaxy is shaped like, a pancake, but it's got those spiral arms. You can see the spiral arms. You can see the, the, uh, uh, the dust lanes, and uh, you can see that there's two companions, two little brothers of uh, Andromeda, and they were probably grabbed and pulled in with the gravity tractor beam, okay? And, uh, and so they're smaller. And so uh, that's like uh, Messier 32 and number 110 there, but they are um, real close by. And you know that we have two little brothers too to the uh, Milky Way galaxy, the Magellanic Clouds. But uh, in Michigan, we can't see them. They're in the Southern Hemisphere. I've never seen them. I hope to do that someday. But um, lastly, I just want to zoom in just to uh, 
to look, take a look at some of these, uh, to look at these dust lanes. You can really uh, start to see some uh, detail. Look at that. These are uh, just clouds of dust. And these clouds of dust prevent us from seeing the stars behind. This glow is stars. Who gave galaxies their names? Oh, well, the galaxies got numerical names. Oh, really? the, oh the question is, uh, how do the galaxies get their names? And Andromeda Galaxy gets its name from the Andromeda constellation it's in, which is the ancient Greeks were the ones to put together constellations for us. And I think the Romans had a part also. And so we are relying on their mythology. And so the things that, are, uh, that they put their gods up in the sky, and that's, that became the constellations. So that's how we got the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, but a, an uh, old astronomer uh, named uh, Messier, he um, numbered objects in the sky. Let's see if we can see any other cool details in this picture. You can start to see um, bunches of blue stars here, like this right here. There's a bunch of blue stars. These are very young. They were just born. And if there is a chunk of red, it means that that's where stars are being born right now. And that's, they're called H2 regions. I know that there's one right there and one right there. So that just gives you an idea of... Uh, what you could do, what you could see from uh, one 45-second exposure. And I'm using a program called Backyard EOS. And this is a Canon camera, right, just like you could buy. But it's been modified to be more sensitive to red because the cool stuff in the sky is red. And uh, I can vary the uh, shutter speed and I can vary the sensitivity. I've really cranked up the sensitivity tonight because we want to be able to really get a good shot of this. So that's what you can get with a single shot. What if we were able to stack up like eight hours of pictures? Well, here's what we can get. I will show you in eight hours. Here is my next frame. There, that's eight hours. So that took eight hours, and that's what you get. You get more color. Yeah, in just a you know one minute exposure, you're not going to get color, but if you take hours, you're going to get color, and uh, and really that's what you get is less noise, more signal, more detail. So that's my Andromeda shot. And if there's any not any questions, there is one the composition of dust lanes. The composition of dust lanes. These dust lanes are dust. That's all there. Uh, dust, dust is, um, well, that's a good question. Yes, uh, dust, oh boy, well, it's not going to be hydrogen or helium or, or, or any of those uh, gases. It's going to be more uh, of things that will be more Iron? opaque. Um, I, I, well, we're probably going to be lower on the uh, uh, periodic chart, like carbon, right? That's a, that's a pretty low number. It's probably things like carbon. Um, and, and uh, other elements um, that form that. It's, it's definitely opaque, and so you can't see through it. Are those colors real? Uh, my colors, uh, are the, my color on the picture is real. Um, all I did was emphasize. I turned up the volume on, on the colors. I'm just emph emphasizing contrast, and I emphasize colors. I didn't introduce new colors. And I didn't uh, shift from, uh, from what the camera uh, did, only minor tweaks in the tone. So, yeah, but you, you can go on the web and you'll see a whole variety of pictures of the Andromeda Galaxy. And they all look a little different because you're using different programs for, and you're using it in different ways. And, and also, there is no correct, okay? Um, it is, this is art, this, uh, more than science here. So uh, it's really uh, what the eye prefers. Um, and so some people like to really crank up the colors really, really um, high, and some like more muted colors. But uh, Andromeda has definitely uh, uh, got uh, blue areas where stars are being formed. It's white in the middle, and it's got these brownish uh, dust lanes. That's a fact. You can't vary that. Also, the little brothers are bright, bright white, neutral. So they, so you, you got to keep those neutral, and then stars, they got to be white. But sometimes stars are 
bluish, and oftentimes many stars are reddish, orangish, yellowish. So you see a lot of uh, white dwarfs and, and uh, uh, other stars in the background. So that's when you know somebody has messed up or really gone too far on the um, processing of a picture is look at the stars. Do they look normal or they, are they really ridiculously colored? So, um, there is a, a request to talk about foreground stars and, the, and when they come out in front of the deep space. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question is, okay, we're looking at this galaxy here, mm -hmm. but what are these stars? What, what are all these stars around? And, and it's a great question. This galaxy is far, far away. These stars are close, close, close. These stars are our friends and neighbors here in the Milky Way. They, they're close to us. Okay? They're, they're on the order of hundreds of light years from us. That galaxy is millions of years light, of light years from us. Okay? So... The, 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 this galaxy is behind the stars by a thousand times, a thousand times further away. So that's a great question because, uh, yeah, these stars are just kind of in the way. They're in the middle. They're close to us, even though they look far away too. No, no. because And also look how spread out they are. In the galaxy, they're not spread out. They're packed in so much that they, that they glow. They create just this undifferentiated glow. This is uh, Jeff asked how long the processing, um, and and uh, yes, the, the taking of the picture. Well, actually, if you, if you want the the truth about this one, this is three pictures pasted together. I have one here on the right, one on the middle, and one on the left. So I had to take three pictures, each of them probably four hours, and then paste them together. And there's programs that do that. And, uh, and then do the endless tweaking. And so that post-processing was a day, in a, at least an entire day. Of course, it's broken up into several days because you can't sit down and do it for a whole day. Your eyes just cross, and, and you, can't, you, you can no longer pay attention to it. But, um, yeah, it takes a lot of time. So uh, one thing that people don't realize is that uh, taking the picture is just the first step in it is really the easiest step. The harder step is how do you then bring out the details? How do you make it? A, how do you finish it? How do you make it nice and get it to what you like? And there is no right answer, like I said, but it can take hours. And this one probably took at least eight hours of my time sitting in front of mostly Photoshop to get it right. Well, the telescope has to follow this object, and that's the impressive thing about that white tele the white mount that I have there. Though the uh, that you can see here, let's let's take a look at it. The live shot here. Um, well, it's no, it's currently not there, but anyhow, the 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 let's let look at this. Uh, for some reason, it does not want to show my show the live shot. There it is. There it is. Okay, now that's the telescope. Uh, this mount here, this computerized mount here, follows the stars perfectly. And for this Andromeda shot, it had to follow it for eight hours. And so it, that's all the way across the sky. Well, it, it, I did it over the course of a couple nights, four hours times two nights. So um, that answers that. How many stars, Jacqueline asks, how many stars are in the uh, observable universe? Uh, billions and billions. Um, I don't know the answer. It would be... Trillions and trillions, probably. Uh, it, it is, the, the, there's, there's uh, I believe, more galaxies than all the stars in the Milky Way. That's amazing. And galaxies are many stars. And galaxies are hundreds of millions of stars, big. Billions of stars in a galaxy, and there are billions of galaxies. It's just, just incomprehensible. Um, so... Uh, yeah, Andromeda is, and, and now we have a good question. We can go back. We'll, we'll be getting to this this whole spiral issue. We're going to say, okay, what kind of galaxy is uh, Andromeda? Let's let's get into that. Let's figure out what type of galaxies there are because now we've seen our first one. Now we can learn about them. So what I'm going to do here is show the classification of galaxies. This is the classification scheme of galaxies. 
They come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, and there's really uh, all of these major, uh, there's these, um, they, they do spin. They do spin. Now, uh, um, I don't think they all spin, but uh, definitely the, the ones that look like they spin, they spin. Um, but these other guys over here, these fuzz balls, I don't think they spin. But maybe they rotate. I don't know. You know, um, I, don't, uh, I don't profess to be an expert in, the, in a lot of the uh, astronomical details. But what's cool is that uh, these spirals up top um, uh, are, come in various concentrations, and they go around. And I believe that Andromeda is like this one right here. Its category is this one right here. And I know that there, there are barred spirals. They look similar, only they have this bar. The nucleus is not round. It's kind of, it's kind of oval. And I know that we, as, as a Milky Way, we are this one. And a hybrid between the two is this, these intermediates in the middle. And he's got these wacko ones on the right, these irregulars that just have no shape at all. And then we have these weird lenticulars that are mostly fuzzy, but they do have some arms. And then we have the fuzz balls. And basically, these here are cotton balls. They're a cotton ball. And uh, there is some theories about evolution of galaxies because uh, we, we're here, right? And Andromeda's here. We are going to uh, smash into uh, Andromeda, or Andromeda is going to smash into us. And so we're going to be uh, hitting them. I think we're going to be okay because we'll be gone. It's only like 4 billion years away. So we'll be long gone in 4 billion years. But when they do hit and then digest each other, they'll turn into a fuzzball. So all the spiral arms will just go away as they all get uh, assimilated into one giant galaxy, and this giant galaxy will just be a fuzzball, and that's called an elli elliptical. So that's hopefully that answers your question about um, spirals and different galaxies, but uh, the spirals are the fun ones, but uh, there are many different types, and also, you know, are they um, face-on? Are they, are they uh, appearing? Uh, can we, are they face-on to us? Are they edge-on? And uh, we'll hopefully see some different types of galaxies here. So we are ready for our next one. Let's talk about how fast light travels. And how and fast does... And how old is the, the um, Andromeda galaxy? And how old is the light that we see at the end? Well, Andromeda galaxy, like I said before, is 2.5 million light years away. The light left there 2.5 million years ago and started cruising through space. And you know, light travels pretty fast. And the photons that left there 2.5 million years ago just ended their journey inside my camera. So it took two and a half million years. That's a long time. And light goes very, very, very fast. So that's the in incomprehensible size of the universe right there, because that's our close neighbor, <laughs> Andromeda. Um, Does light travel faster in space? Though light, light is pretty constant in its speed. It's, it's the universal constant, uh, light speed. So uh, it's, it's just super fast everywhere. And I'll keep on answering. You go ahead and chat your questions, contribute your questions as we go to the pinwheel. Now, as I said, Andromeda is kind of... 45 degree angles from us, right? We saw that it was at a slight angle. We didn't see all those spiral arms too great. But um, what if we can uh, get a, a view of something else? So now I'm going to go to another galaxy, only this one is even better because it shows um, the face-on. You're going you're gonna to be able to see it directly face-on so you can see the spiral structure really well. This, that's why they call it the pinwheel because it is a classic spiral galaxy. It is, it's one of the most beautiful ones. It's also pretty close to us. It's only, I think, about 3 uh, million light years away. And so it, we're, we're kind of all um, in the neighborhood together. This is our galactic neighborhood of the Milky Way, Andromeda, and this is the pinwheel. It's also called M33. 
And uh, this is another one that is it's just fantastic if you can get uh, binoculars on it. And it's straight overhead tonight because this, this little red uh, um, line there indicates we're looking straight up. The telescope, as you can see from the picture right here, the telescope is straight up. And let's go full frame on this one. And we've got just a beautiful uh, spiral. You've got these arms, one arm going there, one arm down there, one coming around there, one out there. And uh, it, it, this one is particularly spectacular because it's got these what they call H2 or uh, excited hydrogen regions, places where stars are being born at, at a super fast rate. And uh, it's, it, it is just amazing that, that uh, stars are being born it, it, faster than any place that I know of in, the, in our Milky Way, beyond what we could do in our Milky Way. So I'm going to try to zoom in here. Internet is a little slow out there, but it's working. Okay, right here is this patch of... Uh, Red, excited, hydrogen gas, and it get, it's it's concentrated and it's excited and it uh, con gets it gets very compressed and turns into stars, dozens of them, and so the glow here is of brand new stars. They were just born, and blue stars are also hot and new, and you can see some blue ones there. Also, if we just go around all around this galaxy, there are these red patches. Each one of these red patches is just a starburst region. All the red patches. Uh, so it's just uh, fantastic. It's got the little clots of, uh, of brown um, uh, dust, but um, and and uh, some areas of just beautiful um, blue stars where the, the red gas is gone. Right, the, the star has born and blown away um, the gas all around it, so they're they're just stars. So uh, the pinwheel is a great galaxy. It's about three million light years away. And yeah, well, Jeff asked, uh, can can we see galaxies with our naked eye? If not, how does the uh, average person be able to see them? And uh, binoculars. Well, here, tool number one: get away from city lights. Okay. You are seeing no galaxies in the city. Sorry to say that, but you got to get out in the suburban area in the dark as you can, as far as you can, as far as you can. But um, and number two, get your phone app right. Sky Safari, it's free. Get the free version. Uh, I got the like I use the pro version that costs money, but the free version of Sky Safari, fantastic. And then type in Andromeda Galaxy. Hold the phone up into the sky, and it's going to tell you where it is. It's going to show you because it's got a live view of the sky on your phone. It shows you exactly what you're pointing at. All right? Find Andromeda, and then turn the phone off. And also, very important, uh, don't try to do this right after you've turned the car off. Certainly do not try to do this while you've got the headlights still on. You've got to turn things off, turn off the phone, let your eyes get used to the dark. And if you don't let your eyes get used to the dark, you're not going to see anything. I was out looking at a meteor shower recently, and some people sat there with their car running inside the car with the headlights on looking for meteors. It makes no sense. So uh, you got to let, let your eyes get used to the dark. Don't look at the screen. The screen's on the phone. It will ruin your eyesight. It will ruin your, your night vision. Do not, you, do not uh, look at your phone. If you can, like Sky Safari, I believe that the free version does have red. It'll just make everything red, and red preserves your night vision. Okay? Blue is bad on the phone, as we know, if we're trying to get ready for bed, okay? Um, so uh, get out where it's dark, use your phone, and then um, find Andromeda Galaxy, and then get binoculars are great. So uh, low-power binoculars, fantastic. So highly recommend that. And then once you see the Andromeda Galaxy, then you can see this right here. Oh, Stellarium, Jeff says, is, has a phone app that's quite decent, too. Stellarium is a beautiful program for the desktop. It's free from France. It's wonderful. It has a very realistic, nice view of the sky, like a planetarium, right? It's a planetarium program. That's, all, that's what all these are. And so I recommend that, too. It's really, really good. Um, so, yep, and we're, we're, someone has shown, uh, Paul has uh, 
contributed a light pollution map. And so, well, uh, if you if you can uh, if you just Google light pollution map, you can see the light pollution around your house, and you can see where to go. Now, uh, if you want to know where to go here in Michigan, we've got uh, Lake Hudson. Right, Lake Hudson, you can Google that. Lake Hudson is down by Adrian. It's an hour southwest of Ann Arbor, and it is nice and dark, and it's a state park, and it's astronomer-friendly, and on uh, clear, clear weekend nights, especially in the spring, summer, and fall, you'll see other kindred spirits, other people taking pictures and looking for stuff and telescopes, and so that, yeah, I recommend that. Um, Port Crescent at the tip of the thumb. Port Crescent State Park is also a nice place to go. Especially fantastic if you're trying to see northern lights because you can look straight across um, Lake Huron. So those are two. Um, the uh, west side of the state just got a new one, Lawless, Lawless uh, Park. And uh, that's if you're over uh, towards Kalamazoo or in that area on the west side of the state. Um, that's Lawless. And then uh, going north is really the smart thing to do if you can because it's darker as you go north. There's lots of, lots of dark sky parks up north. I highly recommend those. You can just Google dark sky parks. And uh, there's a lot of really good spots uh, in northern lower peninsula. And then, of course, upper peninsula, anywhere, just about anywhere is fantastic. So get out there with the binoculars, and you can really see some, some cool stuff. So what is... Well, when the, the galaxies do collide, and they create really cool uh, merging galaxies. They rip each other apart. Um, they, they, sometimes they have very uh, unusual crab-like structures when, when one is pulling the other one apart with this uh, gravity tractor beam. And so um, that's the, and M51 is one of those. Um, and so uh, maybe I could show you a picture of that. Let me, let me work on that. But uh, galaxies do hit each other, and they do rip each other apart. And, and that process is fascinating. But um, in the end, it, they just turn into a giant fuzzball, just this undifferentiated cotton ball. Uh, so that, they blend together, and like a, a, a bee's nest, right? Like a, um, yeah, like a, a, a... So... I'm going to show you now a picture of, of two galaxies getting ready to, to, to hit each other, to, that are assimilating each other. So I'm going to go back to this. There. So this is M51, okay? And this is one galaxy eating another one. So the big spiral is the big one. It's got all the mass. So it pulls with its gravity pull, this small one, and it is in the process of pulling it in and eating it. And then they will be assimilated, and they'll turn into one. But up until then, look at all this massive uh, destruction that's happening. This right here are stars getting flung out into, the, out into the deep space. Right here, same thing. Stars being flung out into space away. So they lose their membership in the galaxy. They're thrown away. So this is M51. Unfortunately, we can't uh, look at this one um, tonight because I don't think it's up. It's in the Big Dipper, and I think the Big Dipper is low. But um, that's what happens when one galaxy is colliding with another. This is one of our most famous ones. And if you like this, you can go download the Hubble picture of this for free, and you could have it printed, put it on your wall. That's what I did. So um, you can get some great pictures of um, M51 uh, from that. So a good question about that, but I wanted to go back to this. This is what you get with the pinwheel galaxy when you take three to five hours of exposures. So you can really see th that uh, starburst region right there where thousands of stars are being born right now. Okay, so they want to know how many stars you have. I, I, the thousands. There's probably a thousand stars being born or have been born out of this big, ma massive red cloud. Yes. Because look at, there was a red cloud there millions of years ago, and now look at all the stars that are, they're blue. That means they're young and hot. 
all those stars were recently born, probably out of, of a, a, cl a cloud that looked just like that. So uh, this is the best galaxy to show star formation. Look at that one and this one and this one. And uh, you have to have a modified camera that's sensitive to the red in order to get these types of pictures of the red regions because a regular Canon camera is not sensitive to the uh, deep, deep red. So you have to get it modified. So that's how that got done. So that uh, gives us a good idea of what... After looking at this now, th that looks pretty crappy, doesn't it? Sorry about that. But uh, it's still pretty impressive to get um, such an, a, a uh, picture with... Uh, yeah, that was my uh, picture of M33. Yep. And at Ast Astronomy at the Beach, I've had that up in my booth for people to take a look at for years. And hopefully Astronomy at the Beach is going to happen uh, in person next year. So we'll be able to uh, show pictures of the, all this stuff. So what's the next one on my list? I think we've got a weird... Uh, we we're going to do an actual... Uh, yeah, we're going to do an ag. We're going to look through the telescope now. And so what I do is I go to find targets, and it's already up. <laughs> Not all astronomers wear goofy hats. All astronomers wear goofy hats. Yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> you didn't know that? Yeah, you really have to. Um, it's, but sometimes they won't wear a hat until, you know, they're in their, you know, the, the comfort of their home, and you'll never see them with a hat. But that's... That's 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 the way it is. All right. Now this is going to be uh, just another type of galaxy. We're going to crank up the uh, sensitivity even more. And this is M seventy four. I think this is an, another type of a spiral. Again, we're going to be able to, to see a uh, an irregular. Looking forward to doing an irregular. We're lucky to have good weather there tonight in the desert, and there's no wind. Um, we're coming up uh, in the winter, usually in March, we have a very windy time, and that blows my t telescope around a little bit, and sometimes the stars get a little bit jiggly. But uh, we got wonderful um, conditions tonight, and uh, there's never any dew out there. It's always really nice and, uh, and dry. So this is a... Uh, M74, and it's just another uh, really nice face on, but it's further away, okay? Um, those, those of you in the audience can, can Google how far this one is away. This one's probably on the order of 100 or 200, um, maybe 100 light years away, or maybe less, but uh, it's smaller, but it's got that classic um, spiral shape there. Um, I believe I've got... I did not. I have not taken a picture of this for years, which is kind of embarrassing. Um, and the picture. This is the picture I got from my yard, um, like ten, almost ten years ago. So, um, and you can see that my skills at Photoshop were not too good then. So you're 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 also seeing the evolution of uh, just skills with Photoshop. It makes a big difference. But uh, it's a nice uh, spiral. That's M seventy four. And uh, let's go to an, an something else that's, that's going to be really uh, interesting. There are uh, exploding stars we can sometimes see in other galaxies, supernova. And a few months ago, there was a supernova in this galaxy. And so I took a picture of it. And let's go to the picture first. All right. Okay, so let's remember that picture. That's of this faint, faraway galaxy, NGC 514, which is probably 400 light years away. And uh, we're going to take a 30 second exposure of this. And let's go back while we're waiting. This bright bluish star right there is the supernova. And to go back, 
all the other stars you see in this picture are close by here. There are friends and neighbors here in the Milky Way. Okay, They are not in that. That is the far, far, far away galaxy. But this star here is exploding, and its light, it's putting out as much light as almost the rest of that galaxy. So this is a supernova. It's an exploding star. It's the biggest, most cataclysmic event we know of. And I want to take another picture of it because I think it's fading away. So let's see if it is fading away. And I think it is not fading too much, a little bit. I'm just going to zoom in a bit. All right, see those two stars right there? This one here is the supernova. I'm going to, sorry, sorry, sorry. There we go. Okay. So the current view of this faint, faraway galaxy shows these two stars of the same brightness. And the lower one is in our galaxy. And that one is the supernova. Right now, they're of equal brightness, aren't they? But what were they like back then? Look, a month ago, the top one, the supernova, was much brighter than that one. So this confirms that the supernova is fading out as it does through time. Supernovas don't last more than a few weeks or months, and then they fade away. So this just shows that, uh, yep, it is definitely fading away. And uh, it's, it's, it actually looks a little fainter than that star, that comparison star. And, but in this picture from uh, a month and a half ago, it was much brighter back when it, right after it blew up. And it, or at least everybody knew about it. So, um, and, and an amateur, I believe an amateur from Japan is the one who discovered this. He's got a telescope that's taking pictures of galaxies all night, every night, and then um, probably has a, a computer program to compare the picture with an old picture to say, hey, something's different here, something's different, and that usually means a, a supernova. So I'm going to take another picture of this in, in a month or two and when, the, when that supernova is gone. So I can have a picture that says before and after, right? Or during and after. So that's a, that's a supernova. And that was, Missy, that was uh, NGC 514. And now we want to go to one of these wacky, crazy, weird galaxies. Irregular. It's an irregular. PGC 143. Go to that. I'm going to zoom out. And uh, this is down in the constellation of Cetus the Whale. Yeah, watch the telescope move there. The telescope moved up there. And uh, this is Cetus the Whale. I don't know if that's the whale's mouth and his tail. It's not my favorite constellation, but anyhow, it's down here in the southern sky. So we're going to go ahead and, and start taking a picture of that. We're gonna, let's, let's get a good 45-second expo exposure on, on that, get that going, and go back to the star chart just to explain things here. We're, gonna we're looking towards the south. There, the S means south. There's Cetus the whale right here. Um, Orion's coming up. See, Orion, that's, that's one of my favorite. That's my favorite winter constellation right there. And so that's my, our next show, all right? For the next show, we're going to concentrate on the cool stuff that's in the winter. And that's Orion and the three stars in the belt right there and Orion Nebula and the horse head and all that cool stuff. We'll do that um, when it gets higher in the sky, like in February. Right there, there's Orion. Yep, Orion and the belt and all that cool stuff right there. Sirius, the dog star, is great. A lot of really, really good things to see um, in the... Um, in the winter sky there. So we'll, we'll concentrate on the Orion Nebula for the next show. And so now we're going to get this elliptical galaxy. Wow. That's not too impressive. Let's go full. Look at that. It's just like a smudge. Right? It's, it's just a smudge. And uh, 
and, and that's what an irregular is. It's just a, a loose collection of, uh, of stars. I'm going to try to zoom in a little more on this one. There we go. Now, this program does allow you to do some things. Uh, I think if, if we can probably we can try to uh, darken the background and then brighten the galaxy. Let's try that. Yeah, we can do a little. Yeah, that's about all I can do. But the galaxy is just as it's just, and this the galaxy does not have hundreds and hundreds of millions and, and, and billions of stars. or It has millions instead of billions of stars, so it's not a huge galaxy. I want to go back to the um, classification scheme to show what we are looking at. One of these over here. I'm going to move this over here. There, irregular. So now we're here in the irregular zone. So what we have seen tonight is mostly things around here, these spirals. We've seen a lot of these spirals. And I don't think I've showed you any barred spirals, and there's really not many good ones. But um, well, one thing that's nice about having a telescope down in New Mexico is I can see stuff that I cannot get here in Michigan. And one of those is the Sculptor Galaxy. So we're going to do this sculptor, sculptor galaxy. It's in the, in the uh, constellation of Sculptor. A question about Barnard's Galaxy, okay. Barnard's Galaxy. Boy. What well, some of the other people on the chat can probably answer that. I, uh, I, uh, Barnard's, I, th isn't it in Sagittarius? I think it's in Sagittarius. So that's if it's in Sagittarius, that means it's a, it's a summertime galaxy. And so we are not going to see stuff. We're not going to see summertime stuff now, and. What I'm going to do now is turn off the, uh, the light because the light that we're looking at, the telescope we're shining, is pretty bright, and we might be uh, damaging our, our sensitivity a little bit here. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the camera here. So, so the telescope is going to be invisible to us now, but that's okay because it'll provide us with better pictures now. And sometimes when I have the bright lights on, my uh, partners in the building, they uh, will call or text me and say, turn off your darn light because it's affecting their pictures. But this is the Sculptor Galaxy. It's, um, I think it's called the Silver Coin Galaxy also. And uh, it definitely has a different uh, shape than what we've seen before. There, it's, uh, it's at an angle, right? Here's the phone, right? See, we're at a low angle here, this galaxy. It's not face on. It's almost edge on. Yep, so Neil tells us that Barnard's galaxy is in Sagittarius. That's a summertime thing, so we can't see Barnard's until summer. Sorry about that. Um, we'll, we'll do some shows in the summer. But um, can't see anything like that right now. But it's a, a dwarf galaxy. It's a pretty, um, it's an irregular, and it's, no, it might be an elliptical, but it's a dwarf, meaning it's a, it doesn't have many stars at all. And there's a little more noise in this picture because we are pointing low in the sky. When you're pointing low in the sky, you're looking through double to triple the, the amount of atmosphere and gunk. And so we're taking a picture through lots more gunk than we would if we were looking straight overhead, like triple, quadruple. So that's, but this is still pretty amazing because uh, it's a really great galaxy. It's, uh, um, I think I've got a picture of it that I took. So that's a, a 45 second exposure. So let's see what three hours does. There, that's what you get with three hours. And you can really see the, uh, the bluish outer arms where there's a lot of those hot young stars in the, in the middle is still. 
Um, and then there's also a red region right there. You can see it's really red where stars are being born. So that's the Sculptor Galaxy. It's beautiful. And uh, let me see if we can see uh, another very unusual, because we're going for the unusual, I, I think, tonight. Um, Maroc's there. Yeah, this is straight overhead, so it's going to be a better shot. Um, we're going to look for a Maroc's ghost. It's called Maroc's ghost because Maroc is this star right here. Let's go to Andromeda. I'll zoom in. Andromeda is a uh, um, mythical character. And it is. This is the square of Pegasus right here, the great square of Pegasus. This, if you're just learning the sky, this is a good one to look for because it's uh, easy to easy to spot, and then you can really find your bearings. Just like the milk, the um, the uh, Big Dipper is a wonderful way to get your bearings. But the the great square is there, and coming off the great square in two lines are uh, Andromeda, and so uh, this is the. The, th uh, the third star along called Miroc, and it's almost straight perfectly overhead. And so we're looking at that star. There's Miroc, and it is an orangish, yellowish star. So that means it's, it's uh, um, older, middle-aged, older, and because stars get yellower and redder over time. But what's interesting here is there is a galaxy right next door. Of course, it's not right next door. It just looks like it's next door, right? This star is like right in front of our nose. This galaxy is hundreds of millions of light years away. So it's, but it's called Mirac's Ghost, and it's just really interesting. And uh, if you've got a telescope uh, that's 8 inches or larger, you can see this, or maybe 6 inches or larger. Um, but it takes a, a, a good conditions out away from city lights, and you can't fog up the lens with your breath, otherwise you won't see it. So <laughs> that's, that's called Miroc's Ghost, and that's really cool to see. Um, then, were there any other questions that I need to answer? Okay, so that's that. And uh, somebody... Well, the the Big Bang of that's a man that's that that's probably worth a whole session by itself. But the Big Bang is our current best thinking as to how things started. We can uh, everything right now is flowing apart. So all the stars and the, especially the galaxies are are blowing apart from each other. So the further out we look, the things are moving even faster, which implies that if we turn the clock back and rewind, everything was all together in one spot. And that was about 14 billion years ago. And that would be the Big Bang. And s someone was suggesting that we would take a look at the Taffy galaxies. And I was stumped on that one. I did not know what the ta And so I had, to I had to Google that one myself. So uh, I've never looked at this before. So I don't know what we're going to see, but it's called the Taffy Galaxies. And I think this is another uh, example of those galaxies uh, ripping each other apart. Okay. And we're inside the square. Look at that. We are inside the square. So that's interesting. Um, let's go 45 seconds. So, yeah, this is the program that I use to control the camera. Um, if, you, if you saw earlier, the camera was enco encased in a uh, shiny shoebox, and that's just a, a cooler. Uh, I made a cooler to keep the camera cool. It's especially important in the summertime because the, the, de the desert is hot, and you do not want um, a hot camera. So you've got to cool it down. So I have a thermoelectric cooler uh, that goes around the camera. But I hope to get a camera that has its own cooling um, sometime here during 2021. Uh, but this, this star chart, this planetarium program is very 
simple. And uh, what you might get on your phone is going to look a lot more like the real sky and a lot more entertaining, and it's better to look at. But uh, when you get an app on your phone, it'll also show these little like green circles, and these are all the different objects in the sky that you might be able to see with binoculars. All right, let's see these taffy galaxies. I'm interested to see what this is. Oh, there they are. They're tiny. They're tiny, but they are. I've seen long exposure pictures, and there you can see wispy parts that are getting pulled from one to the other. They're basically pulling each other apart as they are dancing around each other with a in kind of a, in a gravi gravitational embrace and spinning and uh, gradually just coming together, and then they'll become one bigger galaxy. So that's the Taffy galaxies. Interesting. And that's they have to be at least 500 light years away. I've I got to believe they're, they're at least, you could look that up. But uh, now. Yep, so I need to, um, to wind this up. So I want to uh, thank everyone, though, for, for their help and their input and everything. Um, I have, uh, uh, and we'll, we'll also want to get people's uh, suggestions for what you want to see next time. Uh, like I said, next time is the more winter constellations. We're going to look at um, Orion Nebula and the Horsehead Nebula and uh, the Dog Star, maybe the Witch Head Nebula and some of the cool stuff in the winter sky because there's so much. The Rosette are really fantastic. So. I want to uh, thank everybody for uh, all the great discussion online. And uh, look out for when we're going to do the next one. It'll probably be in February when there's no moon. And uh, have fun and get out there. If it's clear in your neighborhood, get out there and uh, see some of the stars when you can. So we're going to sign off because I, I told you it would be an hour, and I want to keep it to an hour.